Several years ago, I was invited to be on a radio debate show called The God Squad. It was a Jewish rabbi, a Catholic priest, and a Baptist pastor. I was the Baptist. And they walked into a bar. No, we walked into a radio studio, and we were talking about, we were debating about different issues in our culture, about God, about religion, about politics. And somewhere in the discussion, and by the way, what was interesting about this show was, and we had several series of it, was so many times the rabbi and the priest would gang up against me. You, just, you, you understand how you, you would think the priest would be with me. In the, but anyway, that's how it worked out. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just my personality. I don't know. But we had really lively, spirited debates, and uh, it, was, it was actually a lot of fun and interesting. In one, in one debate, I remember talking uh, on the show, and I said, well, in our society, Freud, referring to Sigmund Freud, has won the day. Okay? So, all right. That's just kind of a throwaway one-liner, and I didn't really define what it meant. And so that week, I got a letter from, and a newspaper article from the Chronicle from the rabbi. The rabbi goes, I disagree with you. Freud has not won the day. And look at this article in the Chronicle. Let me explain to you why he hasn't won. And what was really happening with myself and the rabbi was really a misunderstanding. So I wrote him back the letter to try to clarify things, okay? And here's, here's a portion of the letter that I wrote him. Dear Rabbi, thank you so much for the article from the Houston Chronicle. I do not disagree with you on the shift away from counseling to chemicals in treatment. However, on a diff- I was on a different track entirely. My point was that we live in a therapeutic culture where we no longer define right and wrong as we did when the Judeo-Christian worldview dominated the cultural landscape. Though people today may know little of Freud, like they don't read him, they daily use his vocabulary in categories without even thinking about it. That is true power. I look forward to our next God Squad. Sincerely, Ben Young. So, anyway, we clarified. By the way, we ended up becoming friends and everything. Whole other story. But... When, when I said that many years ago, it, it still rings true today even more so that Freud and our culture has won the day. In other words, we see ourselves many times through the lens of his thoughts, his ideas, and his theories. We've been trying to define the question biblically, who am I? You know, where do I fit in? What difference can I make? The three big questions. And many times the answers that we're hearing today on our social media, on the internet, through different types of politics, many times the ideas that we're hearing today, I fear, are utterly deceptive. That means they have some truth, but it's a half-truth, and that truth has been twisted. So what deceptions could you and I be living in today? What partial truths, if you would, inherited from our good friend Sigmund Freud that we might have imbibed and swallowed, as we say in Texas, hook, line, and sinker? Now, the issues that we've been talking about the past several Sundays, what we'll look at in the future, I realize have all kinds of ramifications and all types of, of applications. So it's very challenging because what we're talking about affects us as parents. What we're talking about affects us politically in the culture we live in. And what we're talking about affects us on a very personal relationship. So it hits us in all these different areas. Back to deception. What what does God have to say to us about deception and how to discern what is real and what is not real, what is true and what is false. Well, we are looking at the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is helping us out because Ephesians deals so, I think, thoroughly and powerfully and passionately with the issues that we're looking at. Who am I? Identity. Where, um, how do I, where do I fit in? Belonging. And what difference can I make? Which is a sense of purpose. So open your Bibles, if you have, to the book of Ephesians. 
Ephesians. When I first moved to Houston, there was a basketball player who played for the Rockets. He also played college for the U of H Cougars by the name of Elvin Hayes. How many of you remember Elvin Hayes? Raise your hand. Yes, sir. Elvin Hayes was called the big, the big, and when we would catch the ball down the post at U of H or for the Rockets, the entire arena would go. <laughs> Am I the only one that had espresso this morning? The entire arena would go, E, E. And I love that. I love having a name where if you, when you catch the ball or, or you're something and they, they kind of quote it. So we're going to start doing that with Ephesians today. So we're going to the book of, Ready? Ephesians chapter number four, the big E. It's the only book, I think, in the New Testament that begins with the letter E. Right? If we're to play Sesame Street here, yeah. The letter E. I think there's one in the Old Testament, you can correct me. I think it's Ecclesiastes, right? That's right. If it, if, if. Esther and Esther. Whoa, I would have been in trouble. Oh, I'm glad I caught myself. Oh, that would have been bad, wouldn't it? Yeah, Esther, Ezra, Ezekiel, Exodus. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't plan this, right? <laughs> this is called E egg on your face. Anyway, let's go to Ephesians chapter number four. It's a tough crowd, Kelly, tough crowd. Okay. Someone's going, you started. I know, I did. I, but we're in the New Testament, Ephesians. Here we go. Let's look at Ephesians and deception here today, okay? Let's follow along. As a result, we are no longer to be children. Nothing wrong with being a children. You know, God calls us at times to be like a child, but we can't stay a child. Tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness, here it is, in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we grow up in all aspects, into, um, all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. So many times it's easy what Paul is saying to us here today, and he wrote this letter of Ephesians, is that we get tossed about by waves, by thoughts, by a video someone sent us, by a book someone said to read, or to look at that. And we get tossed about by waves and ideologies that many times are very crafty and many times are full of deception, truths and half-truths. And many times they blow us around here and there. And a lot of these truths, a lot of these deceptions, to me, relate to the area of identity, okay? So if you were not here last week, this will kind of be somewhat of a review. Um, but we're going to look at this timeline here. Ba-da. Nice. Okay. So you got here 400 BC and way over here 2022 AD. So we're going to cover couple thousand years, guys, it's not going to take very long. Do not panic. Um, Over here, we'll just put these things here. The waves, right? We're tossed about by the waves. We'll talk about what those waves are in a second. But let's go through our timeline. 400 BC, we start off with Plato. We'll skip forward. This is not to scale. I know we have some engineers and some pretty smart, philosophical, and mathematical people here. It's not to scale. I know that. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for playing. 600. These are rough numbers, too. AD. We'll go with uh, Descartes. Skip over to 1700. Last week, remember, we talked about Rousseau. Rousseau wrote the book, The Social Contract. He said, man is born free, but everywhere is in chains. And then we'll go to 1800s. We're going to skip that. That may be next week. 1900, Sigmund Freud. Though I know that's, those are not his exact dates. And then we'll go to 1960. All right. So from here... From even before Plato, which would be 
Socrates and the pre-Socratic philosophers, you had a you know, a, a worldview or an understanding when you were born into that Greco-Roman culture that something was there. Something was external to you. That something that was there, that was external, whether it was the earth or the cosmos, was, was really uh, either God or the something that was there was considered the logos, the reason, or the objective truth and reality. So that's where people lived in the, in the pre-Socratic time and the Christian era. So I could say something like, God is, therefore, I am. Okay? So here, today we're really talking about, what are we talking about? We're talking about identity. Having a stretch today, evolution. Identity evolution. How, how have we evolved the understanding of identity? You know, how do we get from, you know, God is there for I am to Bruce Caitlin Jenner to I think I am a woman, therefore I have a woman, therefore I am. How do we get there? Because it seems like we got there overnight, but as you can see, it actually evolved over time. There was a big change right here when Descartes. When Descartes said, I think, that's a good thing, therefore, I am. So, there's a big change here um, from uh, the way we view the world. So, here, the world was a given, the cosmos was a given, the fact that there was a God, or at least absolute reality, or to use Plato's terms, you know, ultimate forms, that was a reality. And then how do we live our life, align our life to that ultimate reality, God? So the emphasis, the, the starting point was something is there, you know, how do I get to know it? Now from here, it changed from from external to internal. So how do I know something's there? Well, I don't know anything's there, but I do know that I am there. I do know that I am thinking, and based upon my thinking and upon my reason, and I'm not against reason, but based upon reason, I can start figuring out what is there, and I can know for, with certainty that what is there is really there, okay? So that started with Descartes, Rousseau kind of changed it from not only I think, therefore I am, but, but I desire, therefore I am. So again, the, the, the um, starting point is more internal. It's psychologized rather than theologized. So we had the psychologized identity. I think, therefore I am. All right. Then we move to Freud, who I said is one today. And to his influence here, to I feel, therefore, I am. Okay? So then you have a, a sexualized identity, okay? I feel I am attracted to this or this person or this gender. Therefore, that is who my, I am. That is my identity. So, the, for, so for the first time in history, I'm talking about Western history, I'm talking about Eastern history, people are being identified by their sexual desires and sexual expression. That is Freud. Freud is the one who started the whole process of sexualization, not only of adults and adolescents, but of infants and of children. You can trace it all the way back there. And he said that that's one of the most important parts. You know, he said that's the most important part that makes a man a man and a woman a woman. And it makes us truly free. Therefore, we have to be able to express ourselves in these different ways sexually in order to be truly free. And to do that, obviously, you have to overturn a lot of the norms and boundaries that are in society that say you can do this, you can't do that. So we've moved from a psychologized self to a sexualized self, now to a politicized self, which basically says, because I feel this way, you must celebrate me, therefore I am. It's not enough that you 
tolerate me or you say, as good libertarians do, live and let live, you're not bothering me. No, that's not enough for people who are seeking this line of thought. They want you not only to tolerate them, but to celebrate them. Not only to accept them and their expressions, but also to affirm them. So that is where we are within our society. Uh, It's not just my opinion, but other thinkers and people like Charles Taylor and Carl Truman, uh, James Lindsay and others would echo these same sentiments. So you can see how our understanding of answering that simple question, who am I, has changed. It's evolved over the decades and over the centuries to where we're at a point in our society today where this is so powerful, my feelings trump everything. My emotions, my inner thoughts and inner desires that they're more important than any other fact that you can reveal or say to me. And you've got to bow down to my emotions and my desires, or I'm going to punish you, I'm going to cancel you, I'm going to marginalize you. So we're at a place right now because of this being a form of identity where psychology is over biology. My inner thoughts, my inner feelings are more important than the objective reality of my body or the objective reality of things outside of me. You have where feelings are more important and more truthful and authoritative than facts. Where emotions are more important than truth and reality. So we've we've taken Descartes' thought of reason and personal autonomy, we've emotionalized it with Rousseau, we sexualized it with Freud, and we've weaponized it through politics, and we're at a place where I think as a society, a Western society, thank goodness it's not happening all over the world, but as a Western society, we're on a psychotic break. And the word psychosis means a break from reality. So I think we are at a time when we have so, are so pr- uh, promoting and prefacing psychology over biology, feelings over facts, and emotions over truth, that we're on a really, really, really dangerous place. Many years ago, someone said this, that ideas have consequences. Okay, ideas have consequences. Bad ideas have bad consequences, but I would argue that deceptive ideas have devastating consequences. Devastating consequences. And some of the consequences I see flowing out of this identity evolution, one would be as it relates to the family. The family has been fragmented greatly in our society really since, you know, the 1960s onward, since we bought in to this idea that my personal, emotional, and sexual happiness is all that there is. That's opened all types of Pandora's box. That led led to the breakdown of the family. That has led to a father hunger in our society that we can't get away from, and a sense of fatherlessness, and there's a lack of connection between parents and moms and dads, and, and it's really been incredibly harmful. That's why people who have experienced brokenness in the family, and I've experienced that firsthand, People and their kids, they start looking for other means of community. And as a society at large, we start getting very tribalistic. That's because of the breakdown of the family. So our family uh, has been fragmented because of this, I think, deceptive, deceptive. There's some truth in it, but it's a deceptive uh, worldview and way of looking at the self. Uh, also, to our freedoms. that we once took for granted, are now forbidden. Freedom of speech in many contexts today is considered hate speech. And hate speech is basically (laughs) any speech that I disagree with, if you want a really popular definition of hate speech. If I disagree with your point of view, well, then that's, that's hate speech, right? That's hate speech. 
Free speech has almost gone out the window. I, I, my, my kids have said this to me so many times, I can't even say it. Well, you can't say that anymore. What? Or you watch an episode of The Office. Well, they never could say that today. Or I was watching an interview with a uh, musician. He's like, yeah, the pressure we have from our producers and our labels not to sing about certain things and to sing about certain things, that's gone. So if this crazy identity evolution, this ideology continues to permeate our society, it's the end of free speech. It's the end of art. It's the end of humor. It's the end of society as we know it. When you lose freedom of speech and freedom of religion, I don't have to go there. That's obvious, right? Freedom of religion. If I disagree with how you're living, or I may say I disagree with your choices or your, your sexuality, then that's hate. And that's not hate. But someone may receive it as hate. And you're, you're hurting me emotionally. You're hurting me psychologically. And you hurting me emotionally, psychologically, is just as bad as you hurting me physically. Well, once you get there, the wheel's off, right? You know, I mean, the wheel's off. Everybody's a victim. Everybody's being oppressed. Everybody's hurt. So if we keep going down this road, freedoms, basic freedoms, we're talking First Amendment stuff here. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, gone, gone. In the future... Maybe it's not for you. It is for me and a lot of people I read. It's frightening. It's frightening. When you have groups of people who want to enforce this emotional, sexualized way of looking at yourself to kindergartners and first graders and public schools and make that law, man, that's kind of bad. I mean, we can barely understand it as adults, much less as kids. It makes no sense at all. So, man, we're headed for, for, a, for a rough place, I think, right now in, in the U.S. and in, in the Western world at large. We really, really are. And what's interesting is it's not simply people coming from a Christian worldview and perspective that see it that way. I'm, I, I could list for you many other thinkers, many other people public intellectuals, also comedians. Bill Maher, I find myself agreeing with Bill Maher than I do with a lot of evangelical pastors today who've just caved into this for fear of being a pushback and critique. Bill Maher is no friend of the Christian faith, believe it or not, but man, he is speaking truth today on a lot of things. So is Sam Harris, who also hates the Christian faith, but he loves these basic freedoms that allow him and Bill, and me, to coexist in a society. So, you know, there, there are all kinds of people that are, that are speaking out, that are saying, hey, we've got to really tap the brakes here and really evaluate just how far we've caved in to Freud and to other thinkers that are, I think, having a, a destructive, divisive effect on our community today. So, what does God call us to do? There are a lot of things uh, right here. There are a lot of things that happen in society and what society is saying and culture is saying that, you know what, I have zero control over. We can talk about it. We can be informed about it. But what does God have to say to us about this big question about identity again? Let's go back, if you can, Aaron, and pull up. Aaron's a guy that does our slides and stuff. Aaron, pull, back, pull up Ephesians 4, E, E. E, 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 espresso, Ephesians, verse 15. What does he call us to do? He says, speak the truth in love. We grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. So what are we to do? We're to speak the truth. As parents, you're to speak the truth and live the truth in love to your kids. As a parent, our responsibilities are to protect, to protect the internet is not our friend these days. Social media, by and large, is not our friend these days. We're to protect our kids. We are to provide and we are to prepare them for life and what's happening. And we've got to maintain a tight connection to our kids. 
Second, from a political standpoint, how do we speak the truth in love? We need to be informed and we need to be involved where we can. Be informed of what's happening and be involved where we can. And the third, the personal. What if you say, hey, that's me, man. I'm caught in this situation in my own life. I'm struggling with my own identity. I'm struggling with many of these issues. Listen, you're not alone. We all struggle in life. Your struggles may not be my struggles, but they're struggles none the least. And when God meets us in the midst of our struggle, he he doesn't say, hey, that's okay. You're struggling here with these issues of identity and feelings. Just lean into all of them. Why don't you just take your feelings, your emotions, your desires, if you want to use Freudian terms, your id, and just start living all that out in your life right now. No, he never encourages us to do that. When Jesus caught people, when Jesus met people who were caught in the web, let's just say of of identity confusion and sexual immorality, when he talked to the woman caught in adultery, he said, what? I, I forgive you, I love you, go and continue to live that way. No, no. He said, go and, and sin no more. Live a different life, a different way. David, who was on the other side of that equation, when he was confronted by Nathan, was told to repent, change your ways, change your behavior, beg and ask for God's mercy and forgiveness, David, and live a new life. So when God meets us caught in the web of confusion and chaos, he is inviting us in. He's always inviting us in to experience and know and to live out our higher self, the self made in his image, in his image. I am who God says that I am. God is my God. God is my creator. God is my father. God is the one who can name me. God is the one who can identify me. And God is the one who I can take my broken life to and say, God, I bring everything to you, my questions, my confusions, my doubts, everything. God, help heal me. I want to follow you. And he's always calling us in. He's calling us in to follow him. He's calling us in to live a different life. Holiness is a different way of life. Holiness is a deeper way of life. It's a better way of life. And he's always inviting us in. He's inviting us in. Who am I? I am fallen yet forgiven. I am broken, yet beautiful. I am lost, yet learning to live the life, to become the man, to become the woman that God has designed me to be. In truth and love. Freud will not win the day, but the gospel of Jesus Christ will. Pray with me. Father, I thank you that you are a God who knows us, you are a God who loves us, you are a God who meets us where we are. God, we we need your help. We need your help. Um, as parents, we, we, we need your help in this culture and politics. God, we need your help personally, personally. God, we're all broken, we're all flawed. We all need your help. We all need your grace. We all need your guidance and your power to walk this new life, to have this new identity that you have designed for us. You're our designer. We didn't make ourselves. We didn't think ourselves into existence. We didn't feel ourselves into existence. God, before the foundation of the world, you had your eye upon us. Before the foundation of the world, you had the days picked out for us. God, you know and you knew the struggles we would have, the challenges we would have. And God, we ask for your guidance and your peace and your direction. Lord, right now I pray if there's someone here who's never really turned their life over to you and said, I want to receive an inbreak of God's grace. God, may today be that day. 
Lord, maybe there's someone else here that says, hey, I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a Christian. I've, I've received God's grace. I'm simply lo looking for a home, a place where I can belong, a place where I can, I can serve, and you're leading them here to second. God, I pray that they would stand and come and join this church, your church family. I pray for students here today. I pray for families and couples to say, hey, we need to walk down front. We need to join. We need to connect. God, may this be their time. We give you this time of invitation. We ask these things in Jesus' name.